Hi, everybody. This is Tracy. Today, I've got a wonderful guest to talk about parental alienation. If you are struggling with a narcissist or another kind of abuser that is alienating you from your children, then you are in a very, very hard place because it hurts. It hurts to watch. It hurts to hear the lies and the untrue things that they're saying to your children. Parental alienation is something that is, is also being thrown around a lot. And yet the court systems don't seem to really have a grasp on how to identify who the abuser is versus who's just making this crap up. So parental alienation is the process of psychologically manipulating your child um, to disrespect or to be angry with or hostile towards the other parent. And Jennifer's going to explain to us the differences and, and the hierarchy and, and sort of the spectrum of alienating behaviors. Um, Jennifer is a psychologist and a professor here at the um, one of the colleges in Colorado, and she, she's a researcher, which is so cool to me. When I met her um, about a year ago, and then we had lunch a few weeks ago, what fascinated me was all of us sit here in our bubbles of newly finding out about abuse, and we don't understand that there are people out there doing the work to make changes for us. And she's a researcher that gathers data to create medical journal papers to get research behind the data that are going to help change laws. Next week, she's talking at a law conference we always say lawyers and doctors and judges need to understand this. Jennifer is one of those people. She's an advocate for parental alienation. She's got a TEDx talk and she's got an awesome book on parental alienation that will tell you about it. Now her experience and her passion for this comes out of the ashes, right? We all don't decide we want to be victims for narcissistic abuse or any other kind of thing unless we have had that experience ourselves, and we feel the pain and we feel the lack of information and we decide to do something about it. So let's welcome Jennifer Harmon to talk to us about parental alienation. If you have any questions that she hasn't answered here, please put them in the comments and we'll start a conversation. Welcome Jennifer. Yeah, thanks for having me on your. I would love it if you could start off by introducing yourself and telling um, my viewers kind of how you are enmeshed into the parental alienation world. Well, that's a good question. Uh, uh, my name is Jennifer Harmon, and I'm a professor um, of psychology at Colorado State University. Um, I've been studying re intimate relationships since the year 2000 let's say, and um, have always studied power in relationships and how power influences relationship dynamics. And about, let's say five, six years ago, uh, I started turning my attention to studying um, parental alienation, uh, which is one type of family violence that I've studied. Um, I've studied other kinds of violence um, in the past, um, but mostly my interest in this became is driven by personal experience uh, with my husband and as the stepmother. Um, so that drove not, not necessarily my research to begin with, but it, it, um, cause I was just looking up trying to find articles that other people have done on the topic. And I realized how much more research we needed. Um, and so, cause I wasn't getting the answers I needed <laughs> from what had been published so far. So I then since turned my research focus to this problem. And you've written a book and done a TEDx talk? Yes. <laughs> and that's yeah, the first step I, I had initially, in collaboration with a colleague of mine, uh, Zainab Beringen. She's a human development family studies um, faculty member at Colorado State University. And she published a few papers on parental alienation. 
So she's actually one of the first people I actually reached out to when my husband and I were going through it because I was, I had so many questions about probably what a lot of your own viewers or listeners are dealing with. I had all these questions about, I can't believe this person's getting away with this. How are they doing this? And she had the same opinion that we need a lot more research. So after we kind of, well, we're always working on alienation in our family, but um, after things kind of settled with the initial shock of it all, we decided to start collaborating. And so she and I started conducting a very large qualitative research study where we interviewed parents who've been alienated. That led to some a book that we published together called Parents Acting Badly. And um, that book is since now, or it's now recently been translated into Swedish, which is exciting. Um, and then I did a TEDx talk yeah, after that to kind of highlight some of the points from the book, um, how the book is a little bit different than what's been published to date on the topic. Um, and now I've just been publishing a lot of other research studies on the topic. So, and, and when we had lunch a few weeks ago, you were talking about these research studies and these papers that you're writing. So who do they help? Where, do, where does that data go? Well, there's a lot of places. So I select journals where they go to that'll be read by certain audiences. So I might, for example, publish in a journal that's mostly for people who study divorce and uh, relationships after they've ended. Um, and so that would be read by academics, but also probably some mental health practitioners who work with people. Um, other papers I've published, um, like I have one that's about to be published in a top tier psych journal, um, which is Psychological Bold, and hopefully, <laughs> if not, it'll be another journal similar to it, but it, it's... Um, a very important journal that will be read by a wide audience of researchers. And the point of that, of trying to publish and, and publishing this work in those um, journals means that it is starting to become more accepted as a real phenomenon. That's been a real problem with parental alienation as people think it's not real or it doesn't exist or it's not very common. It's a rare thing to happen. And my data does not support that at all. It says it's very common. Um, and so I've published, for example, two years ago, I published a paper about prevalence of so parental alienation. And in that first study, we found about 22 million American adults are feeling like they're being alienated from their children. Um, I've just finished that last week, um, conducting a poll of the whole United States and finding that actually it's higher than that. So um, I won't give it away yet till we, we're presenting the data in July next, next month at a conference and then we'll be writing that up over the next few months. So I don't want to give it away yet, but no. um, it's, uh, it's almost double that, I would say, based on the data that um, we just collected. So, and that data is important because not only do other researchers see it, not only does it then become accepted um, by other psychologists and, um, and other, um, I guess, social scientists, um, but it can be used in court. So when you go to court to argue a case, in order to be, um, in order to enter in scientific evidence, you have to show that has been accepted by the scientific community. Um, there's a, the Daubert standards, um, that's pretty much the standard across most states in the United States, um, require that what you're testifying to as an expert um, or whatever phenomenon you're trying to bring as an action in court has to be supported and accepted by the scientific community. And so when you have articles published in journals that have been accepted by your peers, that makes it a valid concept and a valid thing to stand on when you go to court. So That's really important um, because a lot of people tell me that parental alienation is just thrown around and used so often and that it isn't always the case. No, and I think there's, it's, it's sort of like when people misunderstand what narcissism is, like, you know, there, there's a lot of degrees of narcissism. It depends if you're talking about it as a pathology or if it's just run of the mill sort of narcissistic kind of traits, right? You know, there's, same with alienation. I mean, there's alienating behaviors. It doesn't mean that by doing an alienating behavior that you are an alienator, right? Mm -hmm. um, because the, in order to be considered parental alienating behaviors, you have to enact lots of them over a long period of time with the intent to hurt the other person, the other parent. Wow. So that's how we would define it. So it's sort of like saying that 
like if I punch you, <laughs> not you, but if I was to punch you, that doesn't make me a bully. What would make me a bully is to punch you, to threaten you, to withhold things from you, to make you fear things and fear my power. That would make me a bully. So that's a big difference. So just because a parent does something, like let's say they make an offhanded comment about the other parent. Obviously, that's not a good thing, but it doesn't make you an alienator. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of parents, I think, misunderstand that. Or they go in and say it's alienation because they themselves are doing it and they're trying to hide that they're doing it. But we see that with other kinds of abuse, too. We see a lot of false allegations of abuse that are made by the person who's actually doing the abusing. Yeah. But and it's the same thing with parental alienation. So it's it's not any different in that regard. They're both kinds of violence and people who perpetrate that violence like to deny that they're doing it. And so how does a judge or a lawyer or anyone making a decision trust the person that's accusing if they really are the abuser? Um, just like other kinds of abuse, you need to really investigate it. Um, but it can't be thrown about. And then, you know, a problem with claims of abuse in court, obviously, you need to be careful when there's abuse, because you have to protect children, and you have to protect the, the victims. Um, but you can't, unfortunately, when people do it, they know it's a weapon, and they know that it can halt whatever's happening in court until it's investigated. And that could take nine months to a year. And if the person who t makes those allegations does that and they succeed in the court saying, oh yeah, we need to investigate this, that person who's usually, if it's false, which you know, there's some data showing that about, I think the most recent study in high conflict divorce cases, I think the most recent estimate was about 14 to 15% of them were shown to be blatantly false. Um, I, I, in my case, I've seen higher estimates, but, um, but when that's the case, that parent who's made those allegations, it's, it's designed as a strategy to block the other parent from the child. And that strategy then lets them have undivided attention for almost a whole year of that child. And in that time, they can really have a lot of influence on that child. And so unfortunately, courts, there's not an easy solution to this. <laughs> um, people are working on it. People are, I know at, right now there's AFCC going on, um, American Family courts and um, the conference is going on and they are you know I know people there are trying to work on a solution to try to figure out how best to address these kinds of abusive claims um, make sure that they're not substantiated or they are substantiated to protect children but not do it in a way that drags on for a whole year um, there are ways to assess whether an allegation is true or not unfortunately a lot of practitioners are not trained in those or there's a lot of myths involved that anybody who says something, you have to believe it to be true um, without understanding that children can be easily manipulated, um, especially by a parent that has a lot of control over them. Um, and so you have to have a person, a mental health provider who really understands abuse, domestic violence and parental alienation and can make a, a good assessment to understand what's going on. Um, but there's not a lot of people who have training in alienation at all. So there's a lot of people who have training in domestic violence um, because we have a lot of funding for that. We have lots and lots of trainings for that, um, which is great. We need that. Um, however, I think that people forget that alienation is another form of violence. It's another form of family violence and very few people have expertise in understanding the difference. And so, or the similarities. <laughs> uh, and so um, I think until courts and mental health providers figure that out, we're not gonna see a lot of, a lot of improvement in court right now, so. So, so how, what, what advice or recommendations could you have for someone when they're trying to prove that they're not alienating the child? Mm -hmm. Well, obviously you wanna keep records of everything. I mean, so people who are being alienated document everything. I mean, usually if they don't have a lot of documentation, it tells me that there really probably isn't a lot going on, <laughs> you know, because then they're just claiming something. Same with abuse. Like if somebody goes and says they've been abused and there's no police records, there's no hospital reports, there's nothing from a school counselor indicating that, you know, there's a problem and they just go in and say that there's abuse going on, you know, that, that would raise a red flag that it may not be true. 
right? Same thing with parental alienation. If somebody doesn't have, you know, evidence that the child is rejecting them, they don't have evidence that they can't talk to the child regularly or see them regularly, or the other parent is trying to um, interfere with the relationship. Um, that's a red flag that alienation is probably not happening. Um, but you have to document all of that. Um, in the cases that I, I do a lot of expert witness um, um, work recently, and um, what I do is I look through all the materials that parents collect, and I form an assessment about whether alienation is happening or not. And these parents, usually, if you're being alienated or abused, people who are really abused or being the target of this violence will save everything. Mm -hmm. um, and it's not that hard to pull it apart and see what's happening when you look at it from the lens of somebody who's <laughs> um, are looking for the behaviors that parents are doing. Um, it's not that hard to see what's happening when you actually know what, know what to look for. Um, so basically gather all the information and protect yourself with actual data. Yeah. And if you just go up, you know, and here's unfortunately a lot of courts will just say, oh yeah, well, your testimony is okay. But unfortunately that's not enough. I mean, when you're talking about abuse, there should be a lot more that you show that actually is something's happening. Um, or even with family parental alienation, there has to be proof that stuff is happening. Otherwise you're, you're prosecuting, you know, if this was criminal court, you would never get away with that. You would never be able to prosecute somebody with that without evidence. Um, and so a lot of parents, they just accumulate, you have to accumulate lots and lots of evidence to show that it's happening. Um, and that's probably the best, the best advice to give. And then you have to find somebody, an expert who can help you pull it together and a good lawyer who knows how to present that information in a way that is clear to the court about what to do. <laughs> mm -hmm. And that's hard because you have to find people who have the expertise to help you with that. Um, and it, it, it's really expensive, you know, I mean, it's, it's, I mean, I think as lawyers and other mental health providers start to become more familiar with this problem, it won't be as expensive to do and mm -hmm. it'd be easier to do. There'd be kind of more of a template of how parents can handle this, but it's hard to be pro se um, in family court and do well. Um, yeah. It's really hard. Yeah. And so many lawyers don't even know about narcissistic abuse. Um, they call it high conflict divorce. Um, the, the patterns are all the same, but it's not like you'll go on Google and find a parental alienation expert lawyer. You know, they, they don't put a shingle out that tells people that. Right. Right. Correct. Yeah. I only know a couple, but only because I, uh, I'm in that circle. So I know people, but, but yeah, if I was, if I was new to this and I didn't know anything, I wouldn't know who to reach out to. You know? right. Exactly. The only, thing I, the only thing I knew how to do is go to my university and do a search on what publications there are on the topic then mm -hmm. that's the only way I found stuff but not everybody has access to that unless you're a professor or a student so exactly which is crazy because you know we pay for our students to go to college we should be able to read that stuff too mm -hmm. yeah they're starting I mean luckily in psychology or in science in general there's a move movement to have more open science to um, make all articles accessible um, one issue is that a lot of people aren't trained on how to understand the statistics and other things that are there mm -hmm. um, that takes kind of a scientific literacy that um, you hope people have gotten at some point you don't have to go to college for it but there are some things that people can learn that help you understand what certain you know data means and mm -hmm. how to be critical of what you read because if you have a sample size of only like five people that's not gonna tell you anything you need to have you know <laughs> or even even if it's just a few case studies Mm -hmm. It's it's informative, but it doesn't tell you what the rest, like how that applies to the rest of the population. Right, right. Now, unless you actually have really good sampling techniques and strategies, there's no way to really hang your hat on any findings. Mm -hmm. um, but I would think that that data would be available to lawyers who are going to prosecute in this situation. Like I wouldn't say, you know, a, a random person from Bunko would go and look that up. Right. But you know, a lawyer that's really trained to help a, a case, that yeah. would be great information for them. Yeah. Yeah. And I've been more recently invited to go and give talks at some bar association trainings. So, um, for example, in two weeks, I'm speaking at a, the Wyoming Matrimonial 
gotta get this wrong here, Matrimonial Lawyers Association. I'm giving a talk there. They need they they requested something on parental alienation, so I'm going to um, educate them about what it is and what it's not. In fact, the title is "What It Is, What It's Not, and How to Keep from Making It Worse." Oh no. So, that's, you know, because I think a lot of lawyers maybe don't, if you don't know what you're doing, you can make it worse for everybody. Yeah. Um, I mean, I think there are some lawyers who, I mean, they're, they're motivated by money and they'll try to make things worse. But I think there's a lot who will unintentionally make it worse and they um, don't know the science behind what's best practice. What are the best recommendations when you find alienation happening? I've been consulting actually in a lot of cases where alienation has been identified. Um, mental health providers are saying alienation is happening, oh. but what their recommendations are, are the opposite of what you should do. In fact, in every case that I've been on where they've identified it, they've actually recommended the child remain with the person who's being abusive. The remaining with the alienator. Wow. Because um, they just think it'll, they, and their belief is it'll stop the conflict. And because they'll have gotten what they wanted, which <laughs> uh, from a, um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, so clearly, even if people are, have been trained on alienation, mm -hmm. they aren't understanding the, the best intervention. And what's them. in the best interest for the child. Exactly. And, and it's best. ignoring, it's kind of in the face of what human development research has shown and what, um, even the work on shared parenting and um, how children do better with a positive relationship with both parents. It doesn't matter how much conflict there is. Mm -hmm. If the, even a really high conflict divorce or relationships 10 years later after divorce, if there's still really high conflict, the best predictor of how a child will do is to have a good relationship with both parents. Mm -hmm. Those parents could be, ah, you know, awful to each other or one's awful to one, but it doesn't matter. As long as that kid has a good bond with both, they'll come out okay. But um, and as much as I try to say that in court, it doesn't always work out that way, but people still tend to think that you should just minimize conflict by separating the kid and, and moving them to one person. And that, that doesn't help the child at all. So. No, no, I wouldn't think so. So what are some signs if people like are, are questioning, is this parental alienation? What are some signs that most common signs that people do to alienate their child from the, the other parent. Oh God, that's hard. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I, I mean, so I'm, right, right now I'm actually coding all the interviews that I've done with parents and we're identifying all the behaviors that are described. Probably the most common are um, interference with contact with the child. Um, or, and it, it could be when they're with the alienating parent. So like if, if I'm trying to call my child and they're with somebody else, I can't get through to them. Like, and yet when they're with me, the other parent can get them all the time, right? Mm -hmm. So when they're with me, the child is texting 20 times a day to the parent. But when it's in reverse, you're lucky if you can ever talk to them, right? That's kind of one sign. And, and some of that can be attributed to loyalty problems, you know, and that, that's okay. But that's why you have, to, when you're talking about alienation, you're looking at a whole cluster of behaviors, not just that. So you'll see that kind of behavior you'll see a lot of derogation of the parent to the child as well as to other adults. Um, sometimes the child won't even know that the other parent is doing it. So they'll say to teachers and doctors and friends and other people, and the child won't be a direct kind of in earshot of it. Usually they are, but they won't always be. Um, and then, but, but that child will learn to pick it up because they'll see how other people relate to the dad. Mm -hmm. They'll start a conversation. Well, what's going on with the dad or the mom? you know, that that's, you know, and then they'll be hush, hush, we can't talk about it in front of the child. And then the child will know something's wrong. And so there's a lot of that derogation that happens either directly in front of the child to the child or with other people. Um, those are really common. Um, but then you see lots of false allegations of abuse or neglect allegations of mental health or illness, particularly towards moms. Um, you see um, a lot of kind of what we call legal, uh, legal or administrative aggression. So this is where a parent would be filing motion after motion to try to harass the other parent, try to block their parenting time. Or if you're waiting to have a hearing, they will do everything they can to delay it because that hearing could potentially mean that the other parent will get more time with that child. Um, 
you'll see changing the child's name. You'll see trying to move them away from the child. Um, yeah, and in even more extreme cases, they'll tell the child to call somebody else mommy or daddy. They'll, um, they'll make a child change clothes every time they come home from the other parent, saying that the clothes that they bought them were bad. They'll throw away gifts and presents from that parent. They, they won't relay letters or communication from the parent. So I look for all of those things. Like if I see just a couple things happening on a case, I'll say, okay, there's some mild alienating behaviors going on here, but it may or may not be enough to really make that child fully reject the parent, mm -hmm. right? But over time, who's to say, right? We don't know. We don't know if like you, you see these behaviors, maybe let's say a parent bad mouths a child for 10 years. Over time, that can have a very serious impact. Mm -hmm. But it's very different than like, for example, false allegations and then taking the child away completely from the other parent. That's like a one-time event, but it has serious consequences from that point forward. Right. Um, so it's, we don't know yet about how severe the behavior is and what effect that has on the kid, because there's many ways you can define how severe it is. And we don't know length of time. We d there's, you know, you have to look at the temperament of the child. <laughs> you have to look at the live, the custody arrangement and how often the child is actually able to see the other parent. Um, so a lot of those factors play into that, but those are some of the kinds of behaviors. Um, there's many more. I mean, sometimes I mean, they'll tell a child, for example, one of the most horrifying ones I heard recently was, and I've heard it in several of my interviews, is that the parent will tell the other parent not to come. So the alienator will say, don't come to your, your uh, visit. I'm not going to let you see the child. Mm -hmm. And then they'll tell the child, go wait outside till they come to pick you up. And the child will be sitting there and feel like the parent doesn't love them and pick them up. And yet they orchestrated the whole thing. Wow. And it's horrifying. It's horrifying. I mean, every time I kind of think about that, I get all teary eyed because you think about that poor child who's waiting for a parent that they want to see. Um, and sometimes you'll see that behavior happen when the child's younger because they're trying to plant the seed that they don't care. Um, and that's the most devastating because the child at that point hasn't rejected that parent and they're really pushing them to do that at that age. And, and that's, I think, probably the, one of the most painful ones I've, I've heard recently. <laughs> And I've, I've heard of, of children coming back and the parents asking what, what did, what happened at daddy's house or can you record him? Like yep. taking a oh, 10 year old yeah. and asking them when daddy says these things, record it. Yeah. yeah. It's getting the child involved. And it's bad, right? Yeah. Yeah. Spying. Oh my gosh. Yeah. So sometimes they have parents go and dig or they'll ask the kids to go and dig through their desk and find financial records. They'll have them come and report on whoever they're dating. Um, I mean, and a lot of these parents, aside from all of this, they're doing other behaviors too. They're not just doing that. I mean, so you got to think about the, the, the way we define alienation is to hurt the relationship between the child and the other parent. But also you can broaden that definition a little bit more. The reason they're doing it is to hurt the parent, right? That's the intent. And they're hurting that person because they have a relationship with the child. So when you have, when you expand it a little bit differently and not just think about the child, you think about the two parents, they're trying to hurt the parent. They're engaging in lots of other behaviors just because they're the parent of the child. So they're harassing them. They're stalking them. They're driving by and taking photos of their house. They have neighbors spying on them. They have people go up and approach them in restaurants telling them how horrible they are. Um, you know, they have, they, they, they hire bodyguards to go and, you know, like, you know, stand between them and the kids at soccer, soccer practices. Um, they do lots of things to create the impression in, in the other parent that they're in danger to be around them or that they're in danger, that they're the dangerous one. Uh, and also just to harass them. They try to get them fired. They call and, you know, try to call human resources or call whoever to try to get them fired from their job. Um, I know a lot of people in the military, their, their exes will call their commanders and say that they're using drugs or other things to try to get them kicked out of the military. And so they're doing a lot of behaviors that they're not involving the child, but they're doing it because they're a parent to the child, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. So it's, it's the abusive, it's, you know, a lot of them are narcissistic and that's why they're doing it or they're borderline and that's why they're doing it. But Right. And, the, and the, the traditional schmear campaign um, you know, if, if they're the abusing parent, they're then telling the neighbors and the soccer coach and the teachers and the principal. Yeah. When the, the other parent walks into school and finds out that they've been smeared and everyone starts to believe it, 
they're isolating them from all of the support that the child needs desperately. Absolutely. Yeah. So. I mean, and no parent's perfect. So even if, I mean, who cares if you're not a perfect parent, but I mean, children have a right to have a, as long as you're healthy, you're not abusing them. Yeah. I mean, you know, it's just like the children just need somebody to love them. Yeah. And the thing is like, I think this is a really important distinction that has been made is that children who are actually abused, you know, like by, by somebody don't reject them the way that alienated children do. They, they become estranged from them, you know, like, so, but they're oftentimes very ambivalent. Like they want to see them, but at the same time, they've been hurt by them. Mm -hmm. But you don't see the kind of refusal of contact, like, especially at teenage year. I mean, as people get older, you'll see it more, but estrangement usually happens later. Um, when children are older, when kids are younger, they just kind of like, oh, okay. They're like you don't see them running away from the abuser. In fact, the very, in fact, Amy Baker was quoted recently as saying, you know, the very person who's doing the abusing, the kid clings to the most, right? So you see that, um, that's a, not a direct quote, but it's, that's what I inferred from what she was saying is you don't see what, with them, what you see with children who are alienated. A lot of times the reasons for alienation are very um, vague and unjustified. Mm -hmm. um, or the reasons for rejecting that parent. Yeah, um, like it's just boring at mom's house or, uh, you know, they'll come up with, you know, things that are ridiculous, you know, that there's no reason or really exaggerated reasons like all mom or dad wants to do with me is X and that's all they care about. And right. Like, you know, I wasn't alienated as a child and my parents made me go and do all sorts of things I didn't like, but it doesn't mean I want to stop hanging out with them. Right. <laughs> so Exactly. Exactly. So, so uh, what, are, what are some things that a parent can do or maybe even some things that they shouldn't do with regard to the child? Like we know we don't want to get them involved in the daddy says, mommy says, we, we know that instinctively, but there's a lot deeper things that I think some of the parents that are going to listen to this would love some advice, like be really careful or do this. What, what do you mm -hmm. have for us? So, yeah, so this is tricky. Yeah, so um, when, it, when you hear that the child's been told bad things about you, um, it's tempting to try to correct them, right? Because you, it's your, you know, it's A, you know it's not true, and B, it's horrifying to think your child would actually believe that about you, right? Um, sometimes they say it just to see how you're going to react. Um, and kids, kids are really good at testing you no matter what, whether it's alienation or not, they love to test limits. So that's just part of trying to become an independent person. Right. Um, but when a child is saying, oh, you're horrible, you're always lying. Mom or dad say you're a liar. You're, or they'll say horrible things like you're a whore. Dad says you're it. You know, they'll say things like that to the parent and the parent is left going, you know, I'm sorry you feel that way. I mean, the, the last thing you want to do is say the other parent's lying. Because now you put the child in a position that they have to wonder who's telling you the truth. And typically, they're always going to side with the alienator, no matter what. So you think you might be trying to win them over by saying, well, that's not the whole truth. And it's okay to say that's not the whole story. I wouldn't say they're lying. <laughs> or that's not true. Even mm -hmm. though it's not true. But don't say that to the child because they will, they still believe, like, that they will believe whatever that other parent is saying. Mm -hmm. It doesn't mean necessarily that they won't believe what you say. They might, if they're really alienated, they won't believe anything you have to say. But if you're dealing with a mild or moderate alienated child, the best thing you could do is help it teach him, teach them to be critical thinkers. Um, say, well, okay, that's, that's, that's mommy or daddy's side of version of what happened. I have another side, but I don't think it's okay. I don't think it's appropriate right now for you to know that. Because if you know that, then you know too much about what's going on with mommy, with us. And that's not your place as a child. You know, I love you. My, my role as a parent is to just parent you and not to put you in the middle. So I'm sorry you heard that. I'm sorry you were told that. And I'm sorry how you feel because of that. Mm -hmm. You know, so you don't, you don't call out the other parent for doing something wrong. <laughs> you validate the feelings of the child and about how confused they must be that they are in this position, that they're being told this, you know, about them. And it's hard to do that in a calm way, especially when they've adopted a lot of it and they're very angry with you. Mm -hmm. um, it's one thing to kind of have a child say, is that true? Or, you know, something like that. And you don't want to say, no, that's not true either. You know, you have, <laughs> and it's so hard to do. It's, it's so hard because 
you know, it's, it's, it's painful to know that your child thinks certain things. So that, that's one thing to deal with the bad mouthing or the, the negativity towards you. Um, if you go to try to pick up a child and they're not coming out of the house or they're trying to resist, resist coming over, this is tricky because it's a slippery slope. The minute you start being letting parenting time go that you're court ordered or allowed to have, then the child feels entitled to just exercise their own authority about when they want to go and when they don't. And from the very first time that happens and you say, okay, you can stay with mom, you're not feeling well, or you can stay with dad. That's fine. I'll see you tomorrow. Now that child can use that excuse anytime they want, anytime they want to come over. And whenever they're feeling conflict, and it may not be because of anything that you've done, if they're feeling conflict because what that other parent's saying, they're going to opt to stay out of that conflict and just not go over to the house. Right. So over time then, in order to justify why they did that, they're going to start to turn their feelings towards that parent. Mm -hmm. Because it's hard to justify why you love somebody and yet you reject them. Um, And so that dissonance or that kind of conflict that children feel they have to, in order to resolve that, they will reject and hate that parent to, in order to feel okay with their behavior. Right. Because they're being told to behave in a way that's not consistent with how they feel. Right. About the parent. Right. And so that's from the child's perspective. Obviously, as an adult, we think, oh, well, why can't you just do this? But children are not that sophisticated yet in their development. Right. They don't, they aren't able to do a lot of perspective taking until probably their mid twenties is when our, we are actually, our brains are fully developed by 25. So kids do not, even at, even in college, they're not fully developed. (laughs) And I teach college students. They're not, they're not adult brains yet until 25. So um, they're still very low impulse control, um, making very kind of irrational decisions because their brains haven't stopped developing. Um, And so children aren't able to do that yet. And so as a parent, when you go to pick that child up, A, you have to be very firm about your time and say, this is my parenting time with you. This is our time together. This isn't something that can be decided by anybody but a judge. (laughs) If you have to go to that extreme, you have to kind of lay down because it is a court order. It's, it's, it's like a law. Mm -hmm. And if the mom or the dad try to interfere with that, they are breaking an order. And if the child is being told that they can do that, that parent is teaching them to be a sociopath, essentially, or <laughs> ignore, <laughs> ignore the law. Um, but that has to be very clear. And then, you, unfortunately, if the parent does interfere with that, you have to, you don't want to go to the house and make a scene. That just, that just reaffirms to the child that You're they right. have their, yeah, that, that, oh, okay, look, look how crazy they are. Of course, I'm not going to go with them, right? Um, but it's hard not to do that when you're desperate and you love your child and you're very nervous about losing them um but you have to kind of just maybe show up wait 15 minutes they don't come out or you send out you send a text or a contact to the parent and say i'm here you have to create a a trail you have to create a paper trail do not call because you won't have a record of that (laughs) do not leave a voicemail because then they have that and then they can use it against you so I, you know, usually in these cases you have to stick to purely electronic communication something that you can record and document take photos, do everything you can to document when you're there, when you're not there. Um, and then, you know, then you go and talk to a lawyer or talk about enforcing your time, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, but you can't, you just don't want the, you just don't want the child to see the conflict. That's the most important thing. You cannot yeah. let them see it. I, I know um, a person that um, their husband used to plan really big things like the concert of the year, on the other parent's time. Oh yeah. <laughs> and you use it against that other parent and say, well, they won't let you go, but I got you, you know, steam tickets or, or whoever band a kid would watch. I don't know. I'm <laughs> stating oh, my yeah. but but that's that seems to be a very common trick. Oh yeah. I like to plan really fun things when they're with the other parent. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, and yeah. Vacations and, then, and oh too bad you can't go to this birthday party, you know. And, you know, and you can, it's inevitable, like, you know, for example, I'm in a blended family where I have my own children and I have them all the time. And so when, when my stepchildren are not with us, we're always, we still have a week where we're, we don't have them. And things happen during that week that we can't always include everybody because they're, they're with the other parent. But, you know, it's hard because then you can't brag about what you're doing. Like my children can't go and say, oh my God, you won't. 
you won't believe what we did this week when you weren't with us. I have to constantly tell them about that because the last thing we want to do is to make them feel like, God, I feel bad. I was with mom or dad, you know, you know, and so as the, the targeted parent or any healthy parent, the last thing you want to do is make the child wish that they weren't with the other parent when it's their time. Mm-hmm. It's so important for them to, to enjoy the time. And, you know, obviously they know they're going to miss out, but you hope the other parent will go and take them to do something fun too. <laughs> that's your only, that's your only hope. I mean, but people don't always have the money to go and do all the things that the other parents doing, but um, yeah, definitely you don't want to do that and don't want to brag about all the fun stuff you're doing. Yeah. But you also have to make it very clear that, you know, your life still continues when they're not with you. Um, it's not that you don't love them. It's not that, that you wouldn't include them, but it doesn't mean that you love them any less than anybody else. You know, a right. lot of times the alienating parent will use that against the child saying, look, they remarried. They don't love you anymore. Or they love their own family more than you because you're not doing the fun trip that's this week that they're doing. And it's like, well, you know, like I said, sometimes, you, you know, if they're always with the other parent, how can you always include them? You know, but mm-hmm. sadly, alienating parents will use that against the targeted parent. So, yeah. And that's horrible. So where can people learn more about this? Um, and, um, you know, where do they go from here? Uh, good question. Um, well, I wrote a book. You can check out my book. It's a, it's a brief uh, kind of overview of the existing literature and the bigger kind of global. Um, I think I talk a lot about the institutional influences like courts and society in general, like people's ignorance about what alienation is really contributes to the problem. And that's what I talk about in my TED talk as well. Um, and so I think learning about it, you know, reading as much as we can. I know not everything is available because it's published in journals that are hard to get. Mm-hmm. Um, I know people like myself are happy to get them and share them with people. <laughs> um, and so, um, but there was also, we have um, a new nonprofit that I am on the board of directors for. That's so what I was going for. <laughs> yeah, Simply Parent, we're getting there. Uh, <laughs> and so, yeah, we launched about a year and a half ago um, and we have our first conference this summer. I guess in three weeks or so. Um, but on the website, there's lots of resources and we will soon be putting out a large kind of summary of the existing research that's the best out there. Um, and that, that is going to be used as our argument for change and what we need to know and our research agenda, what, has, what we have to focus on in order to move our work forward. Um, we have lots of exciting um, uh, kind of initiatives that we're doing as part of that nonprofit and parents, anybody can get involved, parents, mental health providers, lawyers, you know, we have people who are in PR and public health and, um, you know, advocacy and lots of different specializations that are combining forces and we're coming together, even people who don't study alienation at all, but we brought them together because they study domestic violence or they study, um, Narcissist. Yeah, they study narcissists. Yeah, so there's lots and lots of specialties. We even, I mean, we just added on a new board, a person to our advisory board who is a um, retired judge in the, from Israel. Um, we have people from all over the world who are on part of this um, nonprofit, and we're working really hard to, um, like, I mean, we meet every, each working group. We have, like, five or six independent working groups working right now at the same time. We're meeting every two weeks, and we're just crushing our, our agendas and we're, we're moving forward and it's going to be very exciting what we're going to do in the next year. Um, and it's easy for parents to get involved with that or anybody who's interested in this topic to get involved. And that's um, simplyparent.org, right? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Well, and there's also, yeah, we have um, support groups that you can um, start up. It's sort of like AA, like, you know, anonymous support groups that anybody can start up. We have all the materials that anybody anywhere can start their own group. It's meant to be just a, you know, I, I run one here in Fort Collins every month, but I don't run it as a mental health provider, pro, you know, it's meant to be a self-help group. So, um, so my husband and I go and um, we have reg- regularly four to 10 people show up each month. And, um, and so, and now there's some in Boulder, there's some in Los Angeles, there's groups in, um, like North Carolina, there's one. And so anywhere people want to start their own group, they can. And, and Simply Parent provides the resources for that. Um, and it's, that's a great way to meet other people locally who also have experience with child custody evaluators. They can mm-hmm. tell you who wasn't good 
and who was good. Right. Um, Cause people ask me and I'm like, I don't know anybody in Florida. You know, <laughs> I, I don't know. I mean, I know some people, but I don't know who to recommend. Right. Um, the best resource are, are parents who use people, right. Or have, have experience with a lawyer or yeah. have experience with a psychologist and they're like, they didn't get it at all. Yeah. Um, and so I originally met you at a meetup. You were coming there to speak and I was in Denver and, and um, it's a group that meets every month and you were their guest. So uh, I know that there's help out there and I want to thank you so much for your coming and talking with us today. Your information has been really helpful and thank you. Yeah, thanks. Sorry, I couldn't tie it as much to narcissism, but um, don't worry. You know, a lot of the uh, a lot of the parents who do this are just that. So <laughs> I'm sure you. you know can. I say it doesn't matter what the label is. If they're doing it, address what they're doing versus giving them a name. So yeah, exactly. All right. Well, thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you. All right. Wasn't that great information? I knew you would love her. She's so awesome and brilliant. And she doesn't get out there and talk often, at least not to us. So I'm so appreciative for her. And I hope that you will go and get her book if you're interested in this topic. If you know someone that might have this going on, Show them this video, share it with people, because we need to spread the word. And Jennifer's work is changing laws and changing the way the medical profession looks at parental alienation. This is Tracy. Please subscribe to my channel. And um, if you haven't ever visited my website, NarcissistAbuseSupport.com, we've got lots of resources for you to understand about them and understand about yourself and how to move forward out of this abusive cycle. So let's do this together. And thank you very much for watching.